Hi everyone, I'm Anna Katharina Schaffner. I'm the new director of Emerge, and it is a real pleasure to talk to Jonathan Rosen today. So Jonathan is a chess grandmaster, a philosopher, and the director of the research collective Perspectiva. And we're here today to talk about Jonathan's latest essay with the intriguing title, Tasting the Pickle, 10 Flavors of Meta Crisis and the Appetite for a New Civilization. And it's really hard to know where to begin with this text. It's a true cornucopia filled with rich and beautiful thoughts and many phrases that I wanted to nail straight onto my wall. Um, it's a real treasure chest of insights. And we can only concentrate on a few select gems today. And I will try to focus on a couple of ideas that seem most relevant for Emerge. So I thought, Jonathan, we could just start with the title. And as a non-native English speaker, I always found the saying, we are in a pickle truly bizarre. So we have no equivalent of that in German. Although we have, um, jetzt geht's ans Eingemachte. Um, now we have to investigate the potted canned things. And that's something we use to say that we're getting to the very heart of the matter, right. sort of the old, carefully guarded, long preserved assumptions that shape the problem. The idea is very much bravely to open these dusty old jars shelved in the cellars of our cultural unconscious and look what's inside. And I know that the English we're in a pickle is totally different and denotes um, predicament and calamity. And I suppose the saying also has something to do with finding yourself trapped in a glass container preserved in some acidic substance with lots of strange bits and pieces floating around you. So something about entrapment with difference, preservation, arrested development. And I just wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit more about the appeal of the pickle metaphor and what attracted you to that imagery. And more specifically, what do you understand by tasting the pickle in the context of the meta crisis. Thank you, Anna. So um, where to begin? I mean, ideally I'd begin by just like literally tasting some pickle and, and describing it and taking it from there. But in lieu of the jar, let me say that it arose from a conversation I had with Bonita Roy, who's a sort of meta theorist. And um, she's, a, I guess, a kind of farmer. And she's also a, a sort of friend and a colleague and a um, she's a you know associate of Perspectiva as well, and she's been at uh, at least one of the Emerge gatherings, I think. And she um, was talking to me about the the pervasiveness of the language of crisis, and we were both lamenting just how often everything was turned into a crisis. You know, there was the economic crisis and the political crisis, and the, then there was the meta crisis, and then there was the meta crisis people were getting excited by it because it was that was the sum total of all the crises. And after a while, we, we kind of thought this language wasn't ringing true for us. And even, even if there was a sense in which you could make it analytically coherent, it wasn't opening any doors of the imagination. It wasn't, it wasn't eliciting any sort of effective or aesthetic response that really felt valuable. So at one point, she just said, why don't we just say, you know, we're in a pickle? And at that point, I left it and didn't think about it for another year or two. You know, I, I kept on writing and thinking about whatever else was going on. Um, but then at some point I realized that there was a there was a lot of depth to this idea of being in a pickle. So you've already mentioned some of the rich meanings of the term. Um, I believe, and this is something to be chased up with references rather than half remembered in this video, but I believe there's a historic relationship between an old Yiddish expression, which then got misunderstood in German and turned into something else, and then got picked up by the Dutch, meaning you know, peckle, to be sort of trapped up in a jar in some way. And that got, got into a sort of figurative English and then used by Shakespeare and so forth. But to be in a pickle is, is also, you mentioned catastrophe and calamity, but actually I think the way it's used in vernacular English is a bit more gentle and playful. To be in a pickle is a way of saying, yeah, it's real. There really are problems, we really are beset, we are caught up in this. But it's trying to get beyond the language of everything's falling apart, woe is me, despair. So in that sense, it starts from this premise of um, looking for language that's not laden with crisis and yet is somehow capacious enough to include all of the different things that we're caught up in. Um, one thing to add 
is about the tasting element of that. So we can speak more about the pickle as such, and I write about that in the essay. But the tasting is almost just as important because we live in a time when many people are asking for vision. You know, say, what's your vision of the future? And um, politicians are asked to have vision. But in, at a purely sensory level, there are limits to vision, right? There's, um, there's a lot to be said for the other senses too. And in the context of taste, of course, there's a figurative aspect of taste, which is about aesthetic judgment. So when we speak about tasting the pickle, we're really speaking about something like um, an epistemic orientation um, that has an aesthetic quality. So it's something about whether an idea is beautiful and, and fitting and suitable. So to taste the pickle is to feel what we're caught up in, not just with a kind of analytical or intellectual sensibility, but a more emotional and aesthetic one. So to be to be to be touched by qualities of, for instance, the sublime, or uh, to be beguiled by something, or to be shocked or disturbed, mm -hmm. is trying to evoke these qualities of heart, soul, and mind that are not merely analytical. Um, mm -hmm. So that, those are some of the reasons I chose to write about the pickle. Yeah, yeah, it's such such a powerful image, and and I I hear what you're saying about this kind of involving you know responses that transcend the cognitive and that you know involve um you know the physical body and affect and and that involve some responses that refer to to other things not just our you know intellect and analytical powers but somehow to um you know to make it more experiential to bring yeah. the body back into play and there's this wonderful saying by gregory bateson who says that um knowledge that isn't in the body is just rumor and and i thought of that when when i read your essay and um and i just wanted to ask you as well what your understanding of the meta crisis is so so i i get that you were looking for a term um that isn't used in such you know that isn't so ubiquitous and has become quite powerless as a result so my understanding of the meta crisis was also always the kind of club of rome idea that it you know um signals when we talk about the meta crisis we signal a kind of broader systems perspective on on our most pressing crises and we we signal that we understand that you know um the climate crisis um a political fragmentation psychological alienation environmental degradation um are interconnected and that we um that we understand you know that we cannot just look at one and not see the whole picture um but i understand from your essay that your understanding of the meta crisis is much more nuanced than that and i wondered whether you could talk a little bit about that yeah, I mean, arguably the, the essay is, is sort of two essays at least, and there's one part of it that's really just an analytical takedown of different ways of understanding the metacrisis, and there's a lot of things that contextualize that work. Uh, some of it's personal, some of it's more organizational, um, and some of it are the, are the kind of uh, antecedents of the metacrisis or, or context for the metacrisis. Um, so, so the place to begin probably is that I felt the meta crisis as a concept wasn't really going to help us longer term get outside of the kind of bubbles in which that language is used. And the reason for that is that, first of all, it's I once called it the kind of concept only a philosopher could love. Like it's, you know, the very fact that it uses meta, uh, it, it already alienates a lot of people. And the, the fact that it speaks about crisis evokes this kind of slightly panicked response. So that was part of it. It was the effective and, and emotional tenor of the term. But deeper than that, I began to feel there was something about the term that didn't quite stack up. Um, so you can use it as a kind of umbrella composite term for all the things that are going wrong with the world. And you can describe it as singular, the meta crisis to mean everything that's going wrong, right? Um, but that didn't ring true for many reasons. First of all, the people using it tend to have quite privileged lives. Um, people relying on this concept will often um, be very privileged and, and, and enjoy the progress that's, been, that's happened through the advance of scientific progress and even political progress. Um, and so there was something that didn't add up about that experience. But more than that, I began to see that there was a certain range of meanings within metacrisis because 
the, the, often when the word meta is used, we forget that it has its own meaning. Um, and what's interesting about meta, it's a bit chameleon-like. It tends to often take on the meaning of the term it's attached to. So in the context of crisis, that was often used by people to mean sort of omni-crisis or ambi-crisis or something like that. But meta, of course, can often mean within, it can mean after, it can mean beyond, it can sometimes mean between. Um, and all of these meanings are valid in different contexts, depending on what you're talking about. So in the paper, although I describe 10 flavors of metacrisis, and in each case, I try and flesh that out with a particular sort of disciplinary or domain problematic, I would say for the purposes of this video and also in the essay, I, I try and reduce it to four main, main forms of metacrisis. Mm. And um, the reason I do that is because I feel there's more going on than the meta crisis. It's almost as if the meta crisis doesn't evoke the emotional response we need to actually start talking about the things that we need to talk about. So when I speak about the pickle, I'm actually speaking about the reckoning of this moment in the pandemic, the, the emergency that is the climate crisis, the, actually the climate catastrophe in waiting, the, the crisis that is actually more like a kind of political, social and economic phenomenon about governance and power and inequality and economy and so forth. Um, and only then the meta crisis, crises kick in and they've got qualities that I would describe as um, educational, aesthetic, um, socio-emotional and spiritual. And the point is that tasting the pickle is kind of all of that. Mm. And, and I think that matters because metacrisis doesn't give you that kind of range of perspective and discernment. So just one more thing on the metacrisis. Um, the four that I mention are, uh, well, there, there, I don't know how much more depth you want on this subject because I can, I can wax lyrical about the metacrisis. Uh, suffice to say that I think it's plural. I think it's alive. And I think uh, if you try and define it too quickly, you're misunderstanding what it is. Mm. Yeah, no, I think I think what I really enjoyed about your essay as well was how you showed that matter is a very slippery signifier, you know, that changes, you, you described it as a chameleon, but it's a signifier that changes its meaning in lots of different contexts. And, um, and you talk about the wisdom of going meta in certain situations. And I was particularly intrigued by this idea that you develop um, about moving from subject to object and you give this a lovely twist. So, you know, just to contextualize that a little bit. So um, meta is often understood in developmental psychology terms as moving from subject to object. That means taking a step out of our subjective experience to look at it with more distance and objectivity and to make our experience the object of our conscious attention, um, not simply to be caught up in it. So, you know, the Keegan approach to, um, you know, let, let's um, step out of that experience and look down on it from a meta perspective so that we can make sense of it. Um, and you propose a really interesting turn on this idea, namely that we need to reverse this subject to object move and make what we have turned into object subjective again. So um, I love that flipping it on its head. So, you know, so if I understood you correctly, you argue that we need to re-subjectify aspects of the meta crisis and to reintegrate them into our felt experience right, right. and then also to move from talking thinking about it to action taking and feeling it and that's uh, such an intriguing thought right. and i wondered whether you could talk about that um a little bit more and you know explain your plaidoyer for this dramatic reversal a little bit more deeply well uh, I, okay thanks for the question it's lovely well, very well put and also um the first thing to say is that we shouldn't get too high on meta. I was this one, one of my refrains is that <laughs> a lot of people think that to go meta is a very intelligent thing to do. It's often a very foolish thing to do. I mean, just to give some simple examples, you know, when someone says this argument's going nowhere or this conversation's going nowhere, in a sense, they're going meta on the conversation. They're refusing to engage with it. And I think it was Timothy Morton, the ecological thinker, who said that the meta move had sort of destroyed intellectual life because it's always open to someone to kind of give more context, to give one more detail, one more perspective. 
And that meta move can actually just drain the lifeblood out of any sort of human endeavor if you're not careful. But in and of itself, the meta is a clever and suitable relational move to get the right kind of perspective at any given moment. It's just that like any other tool that can be misused. Um, so in the context of going meta from subject to object and then object to subject, this comes a little bit from my own predicament too. It's quite personal in some ways because, you know, by background, I'm a chess grandmaster and I studied analytical philosophy at Oxford. And I spent a lot of time in rooms with people getting high on concepts, you know, just parsing conceptual distinctions and, or, or trying to work out a logical sequence to win a game or whatever. And, you know, there's a place for that. I, you know, the intellect is of value and one should not knock it and be grateful that one has some proclivity in it. But um, I don't feel the answers to the problems of the world will ultimately be intellectual in nature. They'll be much more about the intellect guiding the way in some sense towards qualities of lived experience that will allow us to connect with the right kinds of people, fashion the right kinds of institution, collaborate in the right way, even compete in the right way. Um, and in that context, when we're speaking about the, 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 the work the meta does, you do need to disembed yourself from your experience. You know, you can go away from the immediate responsibility of being a parent, for example, living in a house, trying to get dinner ready. Um, that's a very imminent experience. And you might want to abstract from that and say, hang on, I'm actually just a biological life form, um, you know, on a kind of intergalactic spaceship of sorts that's twirling to the tune of the sun. You know, you might think that's sort of zooming out and it's a sense it's a kind of meta move. And you can actually think on the way there, you can stop in via your local town council and then your local political system and then your you know, the European Union might be mentioned and then the global predicament and then the cosmos. And you can always make these moves whereby you provide further context. But actually what I think is much harder is having zoomed out to be able to zoom back in again mm. and in a way that actually allows that to become a kind of tacit knowledge, no longer explicit and ostentatious, but sort of re-embodied, re-embedded in the context so that when you're speaking and connecting with someone at the level of, a quality relationship or a, a real lived situation, your desire is not to go meta as such, but to be firmly there. So that's when I say going from subject to, to object is not always the aim, it's often to go the other way around. Mm. It's like, by all means, take your abstraction, you know, by all means, know your cosmological and historical context when you're making your cup of tea and consulting your friend about the loss of their job. But don't lose yourself at that context, you know, bring it with you, allow it to be part of the context and part of your embodied and your, and your lived experience. That's yeah. not easy. I guess I'm sharing that. And the reason it's there in the essay is that I think for a lot of people and possibly especially men, you know, the risk of gendering it, but there, there's something about coming back into the body and the context and the lived experience that is really exacting for people who get high on abstraction to become more concrete is the challenge, you know, so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's also, if you want to get people into action taking mode, it's often more difficult to do that if you just, you know, talk about issues at a very abstract conceptual level. I think, you know, the more we feel and the more we are directly affected by certain problems, the more, you know, tangible and concrete they become and the more, urgency yeah. we may feel to address them so that's one of the problems with the climate crisis because you know we we are lucky that we cannot feel it yet in our daily lives so it's a very abstract problem you know covid was very different that way because it impacted on all our lives mm -hmm. in major ways so it was a different kind of crisis a crisis that we all experientially felt and lived through you know some of course to to a worse extent than others um but i think there is also this you know how is this meaningful to us personally um that can be a very very powerful motivator and and you know bringing affect into the equation is also very important you know sometimes i think we have to emotionalize re-emotionalize certain discourses um in order to generate responses um you know and that's something that 
that's a, an ancient trick in, in self-help literature, you know, where you always combine theory with anecdote, with examples, with stories of, you know, powerful self-transformers, which can be very, very inspirational and sort of show you what potential there is for, for us to do the same. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, the other thing is, uh, writing about this, writing this essay was partly about making sense of, you know, what I'm doing um, in my day job. And then by extension, what the point of an organization like Perspectiva might be. So when I speak about tasting the pickle and, ha and have, you know, create this question, have you tasted the pickle? As a way of teasing out, do you know the context that you're part of? But also, crucially, what makes, the, what makes the pickle a bit different is what does it mean for you, bringing it back into your own experience? What follows for how you should live? Now, some people find that easier to answer than others. Some are in circumstances where they, they struggle to get a job or they, they have caring responsibilities such that they can't maybe actualize the talents that they have. Um, but in many people's cases, they want to know what to do in the world. And perhaps the idea of only acting on climate change, for instance, doesn't ring true, or perhaps they're an activist and they feel that there's something not right with this activist culture that's prevent that it's getting in its own way in some way. What is that? And at those moments, you need to zoom back out again. But this kind of, I guess what I'm looking for is this movement between uh, a commitment to understand your context as fully and deeply as possible, combined with an, an equal but 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 very different kind of commitment to to enact and allow those contexts to manifest in meaningful action in your life. And I think it's hard to do them both. And for me, tasting the pickle is a way of saying, mm. get to that experience that allows you to make that kind of judgment. Mm. Sort of a very sophisticated switching from object to subject, from object, so that we don't stay at that, you know, more abstract level, but know how to get back and back yeah. up again, you know. Right. So, yeah, that requires a lot of skill. <laughs> yeah, I think this yeah. is the, this is why I, I wrote the essay, not because I really know how to do it, but it's almost like setting the curriculum for myself and by extension for Perspectiva, like what does it mean to taste the pickle? What does it mean to actually really encounter, you know, the full historical context that we're part of and not mm -hmm. kid ourselves with the latest narrative that came off the news or the latest buzzword concept but to really steep ourselves in all of these different layers of complexity that we're part of. Um, and then find out what it means for you in an honest way. Now, I don't claim to have done that. I'm saying that I think that's what we have to try and do. Um, and the essay in a weird way was an extensive definition. It was me trying to do that in my own way. So that's why I share things about myself in it um, yeah. that are there, you know, that look a bit out of place, but I think that's, commensurate with tasting the pickle is that the personal, the political, and the professional become of a piece. Yeah. You can still distinguish between them, but they're but but they're they're together as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the kind of skin in the game idea, you know, that you show how you're involved, how you're entangled in a different kind of way. Yeah. And I, I wanted to ask you also about um your, your thoughts on we, because that's, of course, a topic that is particularly important to emerge. So you talk in your essay about the lack of a meaningful global we, and I'm, I'd be really intrigued to hear a little bit more about that. Um, so one of the main questions we seek to explore um, uh, in Emerge is what kind of we we could become by experimenting with new ways of doing, being, and thinking together. And um, the way I understood your essay is that you seem very much to argue that we don't have a functional we. Mm -hmm. So we are not capable um, of, of constructing a we that has global agency quite yet. So we have no practical problem solving or world creating we at our disposal. And yet we talk about we all the time, you know, and personally, I, I love we as a stylistic, <laughs> as a stylistic inclusive gesture, but, um, but your essay really made me think of the usage of that word. Um, but I, I, I got the sense that you don't believe that we have this we as a unit of action that can be mobilized. And I just want to hear some more mm. thoughts on that topic. Well, yeah, so this is um, both a, 
a challenge and a kind of an opportunity, I suppose. I think the reason it's it's so important to Perspectiva and Emerge is that it's often taken for granted uh, that when we say we should do X, Y, or Z, that we know what we're talking about. Um, now, if this is not a new observation, of course, that, that in itself is not new at all. I mean, you could say that the sort of modernist we is taken for granted. It's sort of universal, hegemonic. It's kind of assumed that everyone wants the same thing, that there will be a kind of, you know, universal form of life will spread throughout the globe. And then the postmodern critique is, look, tell me who you're talking about. You can't evoke we without saying, you know, to what extent, what are the power relations? What is the historical context? What is being taken for granted? You know, deconstructing the we in that sense. But I think what I'm getting at is something a little bit different. It's that we're now at a stage where if you're of a mind to try and improve the world in some way, um, save the world from itself, or even just find meaningful work, you know, whichever of these terms works for you, then you often encounter a scenario where you have to collaborate in some way, quite quickly to have impact at scale, collaboration is necessary. Um, and usually in those contexts, quite quickly, you'll come up upon divergences and perspective of what, what to do. I'm just remind, reminding myself as I say this, that um, the first ever public event I chaired was with a guy called Adam Kahaney who uh, wrote a book called Power and Love, which was based on um, a prior quotation by, I think, Paul Tillich that was then used by Martin Luther King. It's a long way of saying the book was about the challenge of collaborating in complex circumstances. So like uh, post-apartheid South Africa was one and trying to sort of decarbonize the economy, but still keep the lights on and keep fuel prices down was another. And, um, I mentioned him because he often spoke about power and love as in some ways the challenge of the we. So love, you know, the, there's, the, there's the we of love, which is, yeah, let's all come together and build a great new world and uh, we'll all collaborate and find our best selves and make sure that we get everyone doing what they're best at and it will be great and let's go forth and, you know, conquer. But quite quickly you come into power relations about, hang on, this has to be done, someone has to do it, why should I do it? I did it yesterday, yada, yada, yada. I mean, even, even any family unit knows that experience. And even intrapsychically, we notice that, divided against ourselves. So at every single level of the global phenomenon, the pickle writ large, there are collective action problems almost everywhere you look, right? And within those collective action problems, there is this contested we. And the reason this is not just a postmodern critique point is that I think that the we has to be made a kind of object of inquiry, not just a sort of, um, not just something that we take for granted or presume to be there, but actually weaving the we, manufacturing the we, creating it, self-consciously becoming it is part of the sort of curriculum of our time. Now, how we do it is a broad educational cultural endeavor. It's not straightforward. It just means that whenever someone speaks of what humanity has to do, you know, there was a, a dark quotation by Carl Schmitt, no less than the, the Nazi jurist, anyone who speaks of humanity is a liar. Now, I wouldn't go that far, but I think it's just very important to remember in this time, just after Trump and when there's still Bolsonaro in Brazil and there's Xi in China and, you know, authoritarian leadership is not the exception, if anything, it's the norm. That the we, that the, the sort of, do-gooders of the West, if you like, invoke, is not a universal we. It's a we that actually is uh, presumed and actually largely ineffectual because of its presumption. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. I don't want, it's, not a do, it's, not a, it's not a doom and gloom message. It's not saying give up, there is no we. It's saying the we is the work. You know? mm, yeah, we work, absolutely. Yeah, I think there's also, you know, this, you know, this elephant in the room that the left in particular has historically always been much worse at forming a cohesive we. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's fragmented, always has been, and this is um, less able to come together as a cohesive we than the right. And that has always been its um, massive disadvantage. And that might be because they're, you know, more complex and ethical and less ethical ways of forming we, you know, there's of course scapegoating is the ancient um, book 
the ancient trick in the, the book of the right, you know, with the um, Jira idea of, of the sacrificial um, scapegoat around which strong we communities can be formed. And I suppose that's something that a lot of people on the left refuse to do. Um, and therefore it's, it's more difficult to hear around um, other shared strong um, topics that, that can be powerfully cohesive. Um, so I think it's a really, really important problem. And I would say fragmentation, you know, fragmentation is really one of the great things we <laughs> need to overcome and, and finding ways of overcoming fragmentation, even in the, you know, change maker space in the system. Um, theorist world, I think fragmentation is a real issue, which is why we, we at Emerge are so interested in pattern detection, you know, finding patterns that unite us and also finding questions around which we can cohere. Mm -hmm. So yes, and, and so, so two things there. Uh, the first is that, you know, this could become tedious. In other words, I, I wouldn't want it to be the case that people suddenly feel they can't say we without inverted commas or, you know, it's a normal word in everyday language. And um, yes, I think if we wanted to create language forms to better reflect the kinds of words we need, we might want to look at other languages and how they play with different kinds of uh, forms of we. Um, I think um, the book by Yanka Porta, um, I forget what it's called now, um, but the the Australian indigenous knowledge, the Aboriginal terminologies of, of different patterns of we was an interesting eye opener there. That there are ways of describing us and we that is a bit more discriminating. And you know, I welcome that and we should work on it. But equally, I still use we myself every day and I, I in all sorts of contexts. So it's not as though we should always point some we shame people. Like, that's not the idea. Um, but the other thing to say is, yeah, even within Emerge, right? So my experience of Emerge, and I know that you're still relatively new to the community, but still, it's, it's a good example, actually, to just to keep it real. Because very often in the emerging gatherings, we'll find differences of emphasis. We'll all have some kind of shared worldview, some sense of the future in the sense of love. But once you get into power questions, it gets a little different. So. You'll have a lot of people who are from the corporate world who want to improve business, you know, maybe more conscious business, conscious capitalism, green growth, maybe. And they might even try and build in adult development models um, to try and have more conscious leadership and more well-being at work. And, you know, I'm not knocking any of these things. It's all essential. But it is an open question whether that really is the same spirit of inquiry and endeavor as those who are in the same meeting and talking about uh, you know, the pro possible end of capitalism being a pre prerequisite for an ecologically sound world. And then how do they meet and, and where do they meet? Often they don't, because often it's kind of assumed that they're just doing the same thing. But sooner or later, this encounter happens where you realize actually we want different things. And we're, when we go back to our work, we have to want different things to survive. So I guess I'm just saying, let's bring that thing that we're all subject to into the open yeah. so that the we becomes a shared object of inquiry and reflexively, we can then become a different we because we share in that inquiry. Yeah, yeah, I fully agree. You know, there, there's this, you know, tribe, sub tribes, sub sub tribes, and, you know, all have slightly different agendas, slightly different vocabulary, slightly different emphasis and um and it is it is difficult to 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 find what unites us and how we can cohere and how we can align action and yeah. so on. it's a it's perhaps the most important question that we're trying to I, mean, I think it is I think she, yeah i think it is i mean I think the way i put it in the essay is that you know spiritually we might be one but politically we're not and yeah. part of the work is to sort of bridge that gap but not, not necessarily even bridge it just kind of know that it's there so what's coming to mind is you know a person very much admired in our sort of space Daniel Schmachtenberger mm. and you I know you know some of his work he quite often speaks at the level I think in his recent interview he said cultural enlightenment or bust and he was he was sort of invoking he's even in, elsewhere he said something like in a world where 
technology makes potentially makes anyone a god, we all have to become bodhisattvas. So he's speaking about the need for a sort of countervailing spiritual development to, to sort of temper the technological development and keep, you know, in a world where private, you know, drone technology, drone weaponry can be privately owned and anyone who's having a bad mood can potentially unleash a devastating bomb on their neighbors. Um, you know, you can see why you'd want everyone to be somehow quote unquote enlightened. But when I hear that sort of thing, I'm also a little bit unconvinced and unpersuaded. It just seems, it's not that it's too ambitious or utopian because it might just be necessary. You know, it might, his premise is not that it's easy. It's that what else are you gonna do? And I think in that context though, what we're looking for is not so much these ubermensches and these kind of super individuals. It's something more about the, the in, interpersonal, intersubjective quality of not even just disagreeing better, but sort of being at ease with a certain level of conflict. You know, it's not about harmony, actually. It's more about managing the tension of the fact that worldviews will clash, that values are not always commensurate, that a certain degree of tension and competition is an endemic feature of the world, right? And then it's not about, you know, getting to the other side of some imagined spiritual line where suddenly we all live in harmony. I don't know if I'd even want to live there. Like, <laughs> you know, it's not even clear. For me, some kind of contestation is part of the good life. It's not it's not necessarily something to be ironed out completely. So I guess I'm just saying when, I, when I'm imagining this kind of we that we're working towards, it's not all peace and harmony. It's more about optimal conflict, you know, yeah. so, yeah. Yeah, and making, making difference generative and productive in, in some ways, and, yeah. you know, and, and, and acknowledging that it's there and putting it to work in one but, way or another. Right. But equally, I'm imagining now, you know, people within our network who would say, right, but what does that mean in practice? So mm -hmm. I believe, um, and again, I have to check the data here, but something like half the world is under 28 and, you know, give or take, it will be thereabouts. So just when you think of that, what are these people going to do? In other words, what jobs are they going to have? What futures are they going to look forward to? What um, forms of life are they going to seek to live? In that context, you know, most of the wealth is in older generations. I mean, not so much you and I, but I mean, you and I and, you know, those, the boomers who are older than us and then uh, property owning classes around the world. And then when you bring in an environmental lens, there's a recent paper, I think by Jason Hickel, where something like 92% of the excess carbon emissions are from the Northern hemisphere. So suggests that the climate crisis is very much a kind of colonial problem as much as anything else. Now, I don't have answers to those things right now. I'm just saying that when this gets real, it gets gritty and it's, it's, um, there's a lot at stake, you know, the people will lose. Uh, it, part of me does want harmony and does believe that we can all improve our situations without great loss to anyone. But another part of me thinks this is coming to a head and this, th th there will be winners and losers. So, you know, I don't know. I'm not quite yeah. sure. But that's why I say tasting the pickle is not about giving answers. It's just about contending with these things and feeling them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, there was a lovely quote in your um, essay, which I just wanted to share here. Um, you wrote, the world as a whole is not loyal to game theoretic assumptions about Pareto optimal outcomes and we should not expect it to be, nor imagine that we can ever bend it with our wills to be so. And I love that because it summed up so many things. And I think for me, it also summed up, you know, tension that I always feel in your writing between um, pessimism and darkness, or at least extreme caution, and a very tempered optimism. And um, that was really my last big question for you today. Um, so there is this idea that it is, less likely that we will change by design, but rather by disaster, or perhaps if we're lucky, a little bit of both. And I just wonder how you live with this tension, um, how you deal with it intellectually, but also right. in your everyday life. 
Well, it's it's a big question, and um, the, the, the essay is this sort of long form answer to that, really. Um, but I I don't quite know how to think about it. I'm 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 torn because objectively, if I apply my intellect and look at the sort of multiple overlapping problems the world currently faces, um, and the ecological effects particularly, and having no particular answer to that. Uh, can you hear me? Am I, am I coming through okay? Yes. yes, I can hear you. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I think of like the, the meta crisis as understood by the Club of Rome as these composite problems that are, that are, that are com getting worse, that are compounding each other and beginning to converge in some sense of incipient disaster. And, you know, when I think of catastrophic risks that we face through technological developments and falling into the wrong hands, and then I imagine my, my children's life on a sort of three degree uh, world or more probably. And I look at our forms of governance and I don't really see where the improvements are coming from. Yeah, intellectually, it's quite bleak. It's hard not to think this is really not looking good, but it doesn't ring true also. I don't, it doesn't feel true. Um, now, is that wishful thinking? Is that delusion? Is that naivety? I don't know, um, but I know that my experience of the world is that it's altogether more surprising than we expect. Invariably, something happens that we didn't see coming. Now, that doesn't mean you know, civilizations are mortal. There is a sense in which this, arguably the first planetary civilization, I have a colleague, Mark Vernon, whom you know, who doesn't think that we have a planetary civilization, and he might be right, but we certainly have a more planetary civilization than ever. Um, and there is a sense in which it, it may cease to exist, or it may become so uh, degraded that it ceases to be worth living on, or you know, um, something of that effect. You know, a sort of asteroid-like level damage happening to the Earth is conceivable in the next hundred years. But you know, meanwhile, um, you know, there's delicious food, and there's wonderful friends, and there's glorious sunlight, and there's delectable music, and life feels abundantly worth living. And I don't regret any of it at some level. And I and I wish others well, and I I want to believe that this life is worth fighting for, and you know, uh, preserving. I mean, that preserving is quite important because. You know, you mentioned the left earlier, like, I am often in networks where the emphasis is on changing everything. And that's not really my experience. I, I've, I, I'm not in any conventional sense conservative, but I, I do recognize that we've achieved a great deal. And there's a lot of an implicit inherent wisdom in a lot of the institutions and patterns of life that we've developed. We shouldn't be quick to dismantle them. You know, we should be grateful for much of what we've achieved just, but equally, undeceived about the cost of achieving it. So um, I don't know, Anna, honestly. I, I, I haven't got a pat answer there, other than that, you know, at a personal level, I'm very grateful for my life. And then at a kind of political global level, I think humanity is in a deep, deep pickle. And the challenge is somehow to do what we can to help and try not to be too earnest about it, try not to be too fanatical about it, um, but nonetheless make it a wholehearted effort somehow. Mm, yeah, and meanwhile, there's always emergence as a, yeah. uh, as yeah, a concept yeah. and, full of potentiality yeah. and, um, you know, surprises. Not that it's yes. our saving grace necessarily, but, you know, there is hope. Right. But interestingly, so it's, I'm glad you mentioned that now because over the last few days, one of the happiest things I've done in lockdown is I've watched with my older son, Kailash, who's now 11, the complete Lord of the Rings movies. So I've got the extended versions on my old DVDs that I had from back in the day. And we've gone through them one by one. And the reason I mentioned Lord of the Rings in this context is that Tolkien, you know, the writer of Lord of the Rings, was a big fan of what he called you catastrophes. So the word catastrophe with an EU at the front, and it's not an EU catastrophe, but rather a U catastrophe. Um, and that was a kind of sudden positive reversal of fortune where you think everything is going horribly wrong, but suddenly something unexpected, unanticipated um, turns your fortunes around. Now, 
that happens many times throughout the, 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 the books and also the, the series of movies. And I wonder what that would look like for humanity too. I do wonder, there, it's not like I think it will be a technological fix as such, but just patterns of life changing, for example, intellectual fashions abruptly changing such that maybe we think that consciousness is a fundamental feature of reality after all. And that in turn leads to some kind of uptake of meditation on a vast scale. And suddenly everyone's, you know, more at peace with themselves and relating better. And, you know, who knows? I'm not saying that will happen, just that there are things that we can't anticipate that will emerge. I do say in the paper though, that emergence is most, and this is quoting uh, Meg Wheatley, whom I got the idea from, that a lot of emergence is probabilistic. So most of the outcomes for humanity as a whole are fairly bleak, but it doesn't mean that there can't be scenarios where we not only endure, but actually flourish and maintain life on this earth for many more millennia. Um, so I, yeah, I do think that's possible. Yeah. Yeah, there are surprises in store still. Yes, many, many. Yes. And it's up to us to be this. In some ways we have to be the surprises. That's the thing <laughs> to somehow surprise ourselves and in the process, you know, like Greta Thunberg, for example, she was a big surprise to her family, you know, and a big surprise to the world. No one saw her coming, right? I mean, who knows exactly how much impact she'll have? That's another question. But yeah. phenomena like that remind us that we can't see what's coming um, for good and bad. Yeah, so. absolutely. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. That was a really rich interview. Pleasure. And um, it was. Yeah, I look forward to talking to you again. Likewise. Well, thanks a lot, Anna. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye.